Welcome to the HIV podcast. Each week we focus on a person, historical event or pop culture moment linked to HIV and explore the story of what actually happened. I'm Sarah. And I'm Jess. And between us, we've been working in the field of HIV for 40 years. Our aim is to get as many people as possible HIV educated. Welcome to the HIV podcast. Happy post International Women's Day. Oh, yes. I've turned it into International Women's Week. This is what I do with my birthday. It's not a day, Jess. It's a week. I'm doing that with all memorable days now. Why isn't it a week? Although, to be fair, this is going to be controversial, actually, seeing as how we're about to talk about lots of amazing women. I actually slightly disagree with International Women's Day. Oh, God. Why? (laughs) Why aren't we talking about these issues all the time? And I get that we're like celebrating them and that's really great. Everyone jumps on board this one day a year with their posts and all of this, you know, may we. I just feel like we should be feminists every day, not just once a year. Oh, OK. Yes, I see what you're saying. And I do think a lot of companies jump on board, don't they, for their own exactly. kind of marketing and publicity. That does irritate me. Yes, it's sort of in that same way that a lot of companies have jumped on pride and suddenly it doesn't feel like support anymore it feels like we're trying to sell stuff and again like you're saying that's what I mean as well with companies I feel like why are why is this always on the agenda I mean I could go on about women's rights forever as we know but that's not what we're here for no it's not that will save that treat for another day maybe that's just a whole other podcast just to add to the list of all the (laughs) spin-offs that we have going (laughs) oh well I'm glad uh, here we are Yep, yep. Um, So, as we've said, it was International Women's Day this week, which I've just then trashed. Brilliant. (laughs) I have some facts about women and HIV for you. Oh, yes. Let's hear them. Yeah. So this is taken from a report from THT done along with the Sophia Forum that shined a spotlight on the needs of women affected by HIV. And the report's called Women and HIV Invisible No Longer. Okay good name right so i'm being very serious because these are very serious facts by the way so women make up a third of people living with hiv in the uk yet are left out of research decision making and service design and delivery find that a very interesting fact and this one which actually i was surprised about almost half 45 percent of women living with hiv in the uk live below the poverty line oh no yeah that's awful Over half of women living with HIV in the UK have experienced violence because of their HIV status. Seriously? Honestly, isn't that shocking? It's like I'm really bringing us down, but these are important facts. I'm very shocked. Do you know what? I open my eyes so wide then I nearly dislodged one of my contact lenses. It's like, (laughs) what? This is awful. Isn't it? Isn't it terrible? But I thought it was important that we talked about this Mm. and it's important to highlight these things. Like I said, we should be talking about these things every day, but nearly one third 31% have avoided or delayed attending healthcare in the past year due to fear of discrimination. That saddens me. Doesn't it? But like we we talk about stigma all the time and that is part of it. And this is why we say stigma kills. If you're fearful that you're going to be stigmatised and you're not attending healthcare because, you know, discrimination is a form of stigma, then you're you're not going to be accessing your medication if you're not going to healthcare, if you're not taking care of yourself. Mm. This is, you know, this is why we say stigma kills. And my last fact, two in five women, 42%, said that HIV impacted their decisions on whether to have children. I mean, I I can understand how it could play a factor when Mm. you are deciding. But I wonder if perhaps some of that is due to not being aware of all the facts Mm. that, you know, you can have a child and it won't necessarily be positive. Yeah, I think you're right. They're sad statistics, aren't they? There's so much work that needs to be done. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But yes, they are sad statistics, unfortunately. So it's not like a hilarious, you know, pickled onion corner this week. It's sad stat corner. No, but they need to be said, don't they? They need to be publicised. Yes. Yes, exactly. You know, we all talk about a kind of equality. I always feel like equality is a bit of a buzzword, really, these days, which it shouldn't be. But I think, you know, if we use it too much, we kind of lose the sense of what it actually means. And those stats highlight perfectly that, you know, we don't have equality of access for all people at the moment and we need to work on that and good for us to look at locally how those stats compare to the women that we support so a good reminder for us yeah to make sure that they are accessing the services that they need and they are educated and they do understand about living with HIV yeah 
Yeah, no, absolutely. So that's my corner this week. Excellent. Oh, well, a very informative corner. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Maybe I'll start bringing more facts to the table rather than just nonsense. (laughs) For everyone listening, it's not going to (laughs) happen. No, I'll see you all back here next year for our International Women's Day episode 2024 with my next batch of facts. (laughs) Because what happens is I've worked with Jess for a very long time and every so often she'll, she'll do this. She'll be like, right, I'm going to be really serious. I'm going to be really focused. And then the next week it'll be like, so what sort of fashion things are you going to wear for spring, summer this year? <laughs> I don't think I've ever said that, but yes. You know what, actually, I think that might be me saying that to you. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, no, I retract that. Talking about fashion, um, are you enjoying I know, keep airing. I love it. I'm wearing, so for everyone who can't see us, I'm wearing a Keith Haring sweatshirt. So obviously we did a whole episode on Keith Haring. So today my jumper is in homage to Keith. During International Women's Week work day. How have I managed to do that? Okay, let's just move on. Can we just... We'll edit all that out. You know, yeah, exactly. But I'm a woman wearing it. (laughs) And I'm presenting a podcast with another woman. And we've just done some facts about women and we're about to feature a woman. Right. So I don't feel we've got the gist of it, really. You're celebrating a man. I have uh, ridiculed you about fashion. (laughs) The fact that you focus on that more than our work. We're not celebrating each other at all. We're not, are we? No. Let's move on. Yeah. Okay. This week, we are celebrating an amazing woman. And one that I was very fortunate to uh, be able to meet virtually a few weeks ago to hear about her life, her journey with HIV, her kind of stance on kind of current issues in the HIV sector. It was amazing. She goes under the title of HIV Stigma Fighter. It's a great title. It's an amazing title. We'll put the link to her website so you can all see the fabulous work that she does. But her real name is Eliane Bex. Now, she's originally from Burundi. She now lives in the Netherlands. And I would say she she really is an unstoppable force when it comes to challenging stigma, being open about her HIV status. And when I met her, you know, when you meet, well, when you meet anybody, you get a vibe, don't you? There are always going to be some people that you kind of get on really well with and some people that you're not sure about. With her, it's it's not just a vibe. It's like a whole energy force. She has got so much energy. She's so motivating, empowering, enriching. She's a very special lady. And I left our meeting feeling empowered. I was like, right, I'm going to do this. Don't know what, but I'm going to do it. I love that. Lots of people have good energy, don't they? But she had it in abundance. It was amazing. But I think energy that makes you almost like you're saying, you want to do something. You sort of leave going, I don't know what it is, but I feel really great and I'm going to get involved and I'm going to change the world. Like It's nice to to be around someone and have conversations with someone that makes you feel that way. And it's almost like they're inviting you to join them to, to help out. Do you know what I mean? To do your bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think anybody listening who needs a bit of that energy, then, then definitely go and check her out because she does so much work. And I think it's really appropriate that we chose her this week for International Women's Day. Okay, so Eliane, she was diagnosed with HIV in Africa. She's a diabetic and she has routine blood tests. And one of those tests came back positive for HIV in 2003, 25. And one of her first thoughts was, could she have children? Very apt, as you've mentioned. Yeah. Isn't it, Justin? I I didn't actually know Sarah was going to say this. I had no idea about that. But yeah, it's, it's absolutely backing up what we just looked at. Yeah. She already had a young daughter and the nurse that was with her when she got her results basically said to her, you know, you're crazy. You're going to die. You need to go and buy a coffin. Seriously? I think different countries have a different approach, don't they, to HIV post-diagnosis counselling. This was clearly a very blunt approach. That's a crazy blunt approach, but also the logistics of that. You're not going to buy a coffin before you pass away. Where are you going to store it? What are you going to do with it? Terrible advice. I would, I would agree with you. Anyway, her husband came home that night and he finds his usually cheerful, fun-loving wife. She's in tears and she's saying to him, you're going to have to buy me a coffin. And her husband reminds her of the other life challenges that she's faced. Civil war, so she's escaped the, her home country of Burundi. Cholera. Now, her husband's Dutch, so she's from a country where HIV meds, uh, well, actually any meds are more accessible. And he's aware that HIV is manageable and he reminds her you know you're already 
taking medication for your diabetes, you're disciplined in that respect, you can do the same with HIV. So he's very much a kind of leveling force in this. Love him. He's already my favourite. Oh, no, he can't be because it's International Women's Week. He's not my favourite, but he sounds amazing. But uh, perhaps a calming influence. But remember, he comes from a European country where HIV is is managed dif- and viewed differently. OK, so it's at this point during our recording that we realised Jess hadn't plugged in her microphone. <laughs> oh, God, how am I even on this podcast? I mean, just fire me. This is just terrible. Like, I've been holding the microphone up to my face because my microphone is silly. And if I'm too far away, it cuts my sound out. So I've been holding this microphone up to my face this entire time. And then I suddenly noticed there was no red light on the front of it. And I was like, oh, no. So apologies if the sound up until this point is a bit tinny and awful. But we're good now. Yes. So back to Eliane. She's told her husband, her husband's reminding her to just almost keep everything into proportion if you can. And remember, you know, how amazing you are at managing diabetes, the challenges you've overcome in your life so far. As we said, he's from Holland, so where medication is much more available. And the issue for them both is where do they get HIV medication from in Africa? Because they're in a country where it's not easily accessible. And he has to ask his work colleagues thereby disclosing her status because he doesn't know who else to ask and they point him in the direction of South Africa and a doctor in Pretoria. Okay so sorry because she's from Burundi that's correct yeah but then sorry because when you said he was Dutch then I assumed they were living in the Netherlands but they're not living in the Netherlands at this point. He's working in Africa and they're living there but the country that they're living in it's not easy to get HIV meds. Okay, so they have to travel then to do that. See, it's not easy, is it, to go and access medication in some parts of the world? Like you have to really want to go, you know, and 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 travel to do that. Yeah, and that's what they do. And she gets a prescription for her medication. She does go on to have children. Two sons, both negative. And the first one in Africa, uh, in Africa, it's very interesting when you talk to people from other countries because in Africa, breastfeeding is really, really common. And Eliane couldn't breastfeed her son because not only because of her HIV, but also because of her diabetes. It could affect her blood sugars. So she's having to bottle feed and she's out one day. I didn't know that about diabetes. No, I didn't. We do have women who obviously, like you're saying, culturally, they, you know, it's expected that they're going to breastfeed and Mm. they're very fearful about the fact that if it's seen that they're not breastfeeding by their community, then people will make the assumption they're positive. But this now has given me a new idea where I can say, obviously, we have lots of ways of, of helping support them around this. But actually, we can also say, well, hang on, people with diabetes can't always. We'd have to check because I don't know if it's the same over here. Right. Okay. okay. It may depend on how well those blood sugars are managed because I've not heard of it in this country, but I don't know for sure. Anyway, she's out. She's she's bottle feeding her baby. She's trying to make it look as though she is breastfeeding because, you know, she doesn't want people to kind of pick up on what she's doing. But she's challenged by a small group of women and they accuse her of trying to be white. So her husband's white children a mixed race and bottle feeding is very much seen as kind of a western privilege I would say and they also think she's vain so they're saying to her well you're doing this so that your breasts and I quote keep standing and don't fall down we've all been there Jess why why were they so mean I think that's how strong the stigma is and Eliane I mean she challenges them so she says look I've got diabetes um, and she said, what, what am I supposed to do if I can't breastfeed? And of course, they don't have an answer. And then she says to them, don't judge women for this. You know, you're jumping to conclusions. You should be feeling sorry for me because I can't breastfeed. And, I, you know, I would like to if I had the opportunity. And that really gives an insight into Eliane's character. She is not one for sitting back and putting up with stuff. And that can't have been easy, especially if it was a gaggle of women, you know, sort of a a gang of any kind of people telling you something. It's not easy to stand up by yourself and and fight back. No, absolutely not. 
mean, her little family move to the Netherlands. Her second son's born there. Now, in the Netherlands, healthcare isn't free. You have to have insurance. And included in that insurance is access to help once you've given birth. I think it's almost sounded like a home help. And your insurance obviously know your health conditions. And having already witnessed her baby in hospital being washed by a nurse wearing gloves. Stop it. Seriously. That's awful. Well, Eliane is almost, say, unsurprised, I'd say resigned to the fact that when her home help turns up, she starts putting on all her PPE. What do you mean? I feel, I just, I can imagine that, you know, turning up in a hazmat suit. So ridiculous. Yeah. And Eliane challenges her. And the home help says, well, it's, it's because of the HIV. And, and so she says, oh, just go home, which is the right thing to do. I would have done exactly the same. But it got her thinking, how many other migrant positive women are being treated like this too? And how many others aren't confident enough to perhaps say to somebody, just just leave, please leave my home now. You know, I don't need this. So you'll just sit there and feel extremely uncomfortable and know what they're doing isn't right. But you just sort of let it happen. You don't know how to address it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, she does report the incident to the hospital. The home help says, oh, but there was a language barrier. And Eliane says, well, there isn't. She speaks several languages. And she says, you know, if my Dutch isn't good enough, let's try in English or French. Yes. Oh, what an absolute mic drop. Uh, Absolutely. And the hospital then say, well, we can fire the home help. And Eliane's like, no, that's not my goal. My goal is not for her to lose her job. My goal is to educate. And she does. She speaks at education sessions for midwives and she shares her experience. But she's not ready to be open about her diagnosis. So she's doing it in that professional environment, but she's not ready to share her diagnosis with the world. And she describes that period of time as fighting stigma from behind her curtains. It's the best expression ever. Wonderful. Yeah, I love that. And actually, I think if people aren't ready to maybe be open and wave their anonymity yet, what are, you, you can. We can see. Eliane did it. You can fight stigma from behind your curtains. I love that. Absolutely. In 2015, she puts her diagnosis up on her Facebook page. She feels it's now time to be more open. At the time, she's volunteering at a hospital. Someone there sees her Facebook status. And the next thing you know, she's been fired. And and again, she's challenging this. So she's saying, well, look, my HIV doesn't affect my ability to volunteer. In the end, she has to take legal advice with the support of an HIV charity Because she knows if she hadn't been open about her HIV status, she would have been able to continue volunteering. And all that does is almost perpetuate that feeling of like, well, actually, if people don't know, then they can't stigmatise. Yeah. It's horrible. I know. I mean, when she left, her boss wouldn't shake her hand. And Eliane says, do you remember like when we used to meet up and used to used to hug me? And that's what she's like. She's very logical. She's very questioning. She's pointing out people's stigma, but not confrontationally. She's just kind of stating the obvious, really. Last week, you hugged me. This week, you ain't even shake my hand. What's changed? Oh, you now know that I'm HIV positive. How awful, though. Oh, how demoralising. Yeah. I just think it's really sad, isn't it? Especially if you think someone's, you know, a good colleague, a friend, and suddenly, like she's saying, you know, you're happy to hug me and now you won't touch me. Yeah. And it's just so unfair. You know, people's lack of education and prejudice not on and she talks about more stigma all of this is in a health setting actually and I know people that we've support have experienced stigma from different health settings so yeah. they're not alone although in 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 wonderful news by the way um I had a great conversation with one of our clients last week mm. who had an amazing interaction with their dentist and I just thought I'd bring that up quickly because we hear so 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 many tales of it not going very well with the dentist at all and then being very difficult and you know, last appointment of the day and all, you know, it. there's just a lot of stigma. I've heard a lot of tales. And so I was so pleased to hear um, mm. how wonderful this dentist had been and even sat and chatted with this person about their CD4 and how their health was and how they're feeling. Honestly, amazing. Oh, that's really good to know because dentists yeah. can be problematic. It's nice to know that there, there are good, there are good examples mm. out there. She gave another example of stigma. So Eliane went for a heart scan. The nurse checks her blood pressure. She doesn't wear gloves. Why would you need to? Runs through the medication that she's taking. And Eliane leaves the HIV meds till last. And the nurse says, oh, not heard of that one. What's that for? 
Eliane says, what's for my HIV? Nurse is horrified, tries to kind of almost bring herself in check by kind of justifying it, going, okay, you're African, so lots of them do have AIDS. But then she puts gloves on and Eliane says to her, and I'm laughing because I just wish, I don't wish I could have seen the nurse's face. I don't think I'd be very happy, but it's her approach. Again, it's just brilliant. Eliane says to her, you're too late. You've already touched me. And the nurse, see, it's I love it. I love it. It, it. But it almost feels like it comes with it with a pinch of humor. It's that very direct, like we can't go back in time. This has already happened. What are you doing? Yeah, and I think that humor and that outlook on life is where all this energy comes from. Because it would be so easy, I think, to leave, to break down in tears, and you almost need that. That kind of humour, don't you, just to get you through it. It must be so exhausting to have to constantly point out to people their illogical way of dealing with their HIV. It's so depressing just to come across so many stupid people. And I know that's going to sound like a controversial comment, but I don't care because (laughs) I think they are. And it's just, yeah, how depressing. Just like, really? Really? Again? Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. I mean, the nurse puts on her note, known for HIV with four exclamation marks. And Elian takes a picture. She puts it on her Twitter account. And she says, why do I have to have this on my notes? Why does she? That is bonkers. Well, it, it just makes no sense, does it? And really, I think at this point, she's got two choices. You can either be beaten by the stigma or you can make it your mission to change the world, change the way the world view HIV one country at a time. And I think we both know which one she chose. Yes, tell me. Tell, this is the point, isn't it, where you tell me all the goodness? Yes. So she's kind of formed a brand, really, HIV stigma fighter, African lady, openly sharing her status. That's rare, still rare this to this day, isn't it? Yeah. But it means that she's kind of juggling her work in the Netherlands with work in Burundi, where she was originally from, because she knows she needs to educate not only where she lives, but where she's come from. So almost polar opposites in terms of HIV care, but very similar in terms of stigma. Not just one country, but two. That is quite the quite the task, isn't it, to take yes. on? Yes. So in the Netherlands, she's giving talks in schools. She's taking part in national campaigns. In Burundi, she's, she's blogging. She's trying to help positive pregnant women debunk myths and educate. And all of this is getting noticed. So the journal Burundi Echo, I've probably said that wrong, says she's the first black woman to dare to speak openly about her HIV. Amazing. So she's getting recognition. She's winning awards. Her achievements, it's so long that it would I just couldn't even find a way to summarise it in a short amount of time. I was just like, oh gosh, just keep driving people to her website. But she is, she's getting these rec- this recognition. She's winning awards. She's raising awareness everywhere, doing exactly what she set out to do. And as I said, I, I can't list all of her achievements. I feel bad that I can't, but there are just too many. You said people can go to her website, can't they? So please do go to her website and have a look at those because I'm definitely going to go and do that. Yeah. In 2018, the International AIDS Conference was held in Amsterdam. Eliane, along with her two boys, is one of the faces of the conference. She plays a big part in the conference too. And that's where we first saw her, wasn't it? I'm going to bring that up. Obviously, I knew that we were doing a Women's Day episode. So I knew the name of the person we were going to be doing, but nothing more than that, really. But the only other thing I did know was that Sarah loves her very much and has been... You've, you've talked about her since we saw her. Um, it's part of the... Oh, what was it called? I want to call it the Flame Parade, but that is definitely not what it was called. It was a torch, wasn't positive. it? Positive. Had... She was one of the people holding the torch as part of the positive flame procession at the um, International AIDS Conference. That is a mouthful. Yes, and we saw them all up on stage and she stood out because she was so smiley. She was clearly having an amazing time. Yeah. And I do remember saying to you, oh, look how happy that woman is. And it was her. Yeah. How amazing that now, because when we were flying back from the International AIDS Conference at the airport, that's actually where we first had a conversation about starting a podcast. So how serendipitous that that's where we saw Eliane. Then we decided to do a podcast, really. And obviously, we weren't thinking about her when we did it. And now here we are featuring her. I love it. It's come full circle. It really has. She did some TV interviews for the conference. Because, I mean, she's all over the poster. So now her status is very much out there. And actually, I think, you know, including her boys 
on the posters. That's a smart move because it helped them educate their own generation. So they've got their friends from school seeing them on these posters, asking about their mum living with HIV. And they're just kind of matter of fact, just like, yeah. And they're very proud of her. Such a lovely way to kind of handle the situation. And it allows them to celebrate her, which, you know, they actually, she's an amazing woman. Of course, they're going to celebrate her. Love this. Mm, it's good, isn't it? And to this day, she continues traveling around the world talking about HIV. She is very committed to supporting communities in her home country. Do you know what? It's only through talking to her that I've appreciated how challenging living with HIV in Africa still is. I know that sounds ridiculous. Why am I not taking more interest in what's going on around the world in relation to HIV? And my defence, Jessica, would be that when was the last time you saw anything of significance in relation to Africa featured in the mainstream press? Yeah, that's true, isn't it? That is a good point. I realised it when I was talking to her and I was like, God, we don't very rarely hear anything about Africa in our news. I know there's a lot going on in the world, but still. I think you're right. And I also think that you shouldn't beat yourself up too much because I feel like there's so much going on just here. I mean, I don't think we really know much about HIV in any other country, as, as people will clearly have heard throughout the podcast. It's just really the UK and there's so much happening and there's so much to know and there's mm. so much to keep abreast of that how could we I don't think we could fit more in no that's very true actually and I think in her home country of Burundi there are significant challenges in just raising awareness about HIV particularly for some of the more rural communities they don't have the internet they don't have television they don't have newspapers they can be cut off from the world at certain times of the year because of the weather never appreciated that the way that you raise awareness over there would be to go there and literally go from door to door sharing your word of mouth literal word of mouth yeah wow what a massive feat that is to take on Mm. like a massive task isn't it to try and do that yeah and I'd never really thought about it so that it was fascinating to hear um about how we eradicate HIV by 2030 for example which is a challenge, I think, for the UK. But for somewhere like that, where do you even start? And you need people who, just like Eliane, who are openly positive going out to speak to you. But she's one person. Imagine that weight of responsibility trying to get around to like every house to go and speak to everybody. And, and the reason I say, oh, it's, you know, really what you want are positive people is because we know what an impact being a a positive advocate has being able to tell somebody from your own life experience you know we know that has more of an impact than someone who isn't positive giving education yeah absolutely a real life living example yeah I don't think there's anything more kind of powerful than that what it brought home to me speaking to her is that in terms of access to medication access to education there's no equality across the world Again, it might seem obvious to some people, but I'd never really considered it before. And when we talk about the goal of 2030, again, I hadn't appreciated. We're not all starting from the same starting line, are we? There are some countries that are way, way further back than the UK. So how on earth can this be a global goal? Oh, is it? Sorry. See, again, this is how little I know. I thought this was a UK goal. Is it a global goal? I think um, I think it's more UK focused, but she was talking about you know eradicating HIV by 2030. So oh, yeah. I think it's something we will come back and look at, yeah, at a later date to see how we're faring and to see how we fit in with the rest of the world in terms of achieving that goal. I'm so glad that I got to speak to her because it's opened up so many different kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for ideas. <laughs> Just different kind of thought avenues. What is a thought avenue? What am I talking about? Thought avenues. I love that. Different. I don't know. I've got no words for you. <laughs> thought av- we'll go with thought avenues. Anyway, we talked about what her advice would be for people, women living with HIV. And she's saying, look, HIV didn't take away my talent, my beauty, my knowledge. So whether you have HIV or not, you're strong, you're good enough, and you're the boss. Oh, now that really is the mic drop moment, actually. Absolutely no, wonderful. It really is, isn't it? And she was saying it to me and I was like, yes, I am good enough. Yes, yes, yes. I love <laughs> but it. But she also, I mean, she wants positive women to know that, you know, they are so much more than this tiny virus. It's not going to stop you winning. So, you know, go ahead, go ahead and win. And she's absolutely right. Putting it all into context. 
I think her wish is that everyone could showcase their talents whilst being openly positive. But she recognises that that's very difficult for a lot of people to do. And if you think listening to this as a positive woman, that Eliane doesn't still face stigma, you'd be wrong, is interesting because you mentioned it earlier. Her latest fight is with her dentist. Oh, okay. Well then, exactly, right? Again, I didn't know you were going to say this, uh, but we just hear so many tales of such awful stigma. I'm sure there are lots of dentists out there that don't, as we know, I mentioned one earlier, but I mean, okay, go on, tell me. The dentist had seen her on television. They've noted in her file that she's positive. She argues she's undetectable. Why do you even need to know this piece of information? And you certainly don't need to note it on my file because that note is now openly available for the receptionists to read. And her argument is, if you're not medically treating me, you don't have the right to know my medical history. And especially if she's undetectable. I know. Crazy, isn't it? She says, I mean, and as I said, I've touched on this just before, that she's very clear that not everyone wants to be open about their status, but she thinks hiding it could damage people's mental health. Certainly for her prior to being open, it always helped her. She said to have a backup story. So when you're going into situations where your status might be disclosed, just have in the back of your mind a backup story or something so that you're not going in blind, which I think is perfect kind of advice. Great advice. But again, how exhausting. Yes, but we were talking about going to the sexual health clinic, for example. That was one example I could think of. Have your story ready in case you bump into someone you know. It's not a nice way to live your life. I get that. But it can ultimately be less stressful than going bumping into someone and not knowing what to say to them. Yes, it's a really, really great piece of advice. I was just meaning it's like another level of, of stress, isn't it, really? Because you're there going, right, I'm going to this place, so let's have what I'm going to do in the back of my mind just in case this happens. You know, you're sort of on high alert, aren't you, really, I suppose? All of the time, yeah. So there we have it. This is Ellie and Bex, the first openly positive black woman in the Netherlands, who is without doubt one of the most energised and motivational women I have ever met and I really really hope we can work together again soon and thank you so much Eliane for giving your time um with Sarah to to give us all this information because what a pleasure it's been learning all about her she is amazing I know we say that about lots of our HIV heroes but she's right up there and and you know what this has made me smile so much as well so many of the episodes we do are just quite anger inducing so it's nice to be grinning throughout it hearing such a wonderful approach to tackling stigma and sort of how she chooses to live her life. Yes. And I hope it gives other people kind of the courage maybe to, you know, it's okay to use humour, isn't it? It's okay if somebody is treating you in a way you don't want to be treated to point out that they're at fault. You don't have to be controversial or confrontational is probably a better way of describing it. But it's fine to go, well, you were fine to touch me a minute ago, but you're not fine to touch me now. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. What a great approach. Absolutely love it. Oh, well, thank you very much, Sarah. That was such a nice episode for International Women's Day. I don't know if you've heard any of it, but one of my dogs is snoring its head off on the bed. So I'm actually really hoping that the microphone hasn't picked it up. Oh, no, I haven't heard it. Yeah, snoring like a, I mean, like a human. Wow, really? Yeah. My other dogs don't snore at all. Is this the big one? Yes, Big Fat Tony. So yes, the new rescue, Big Tony, he snores like a human. Oh, bless him. Yeah, I'll I'll share a little video on the stories because people just don't believe me. And it's like, wow, woke me up the first night we had him. I was like, what's what's that noise? What is it? So I'm glad you can't hear him because he's literally feet away from me living his best life. Oh, good. He settled in well. Yes, he has. but um, And he's obviously been enjoying listening to us share about Eliane. Well, this makes me feel better about myself because Rita hates my voice. She wasn't making weird squeaky noises, so this is good. <laughs> weird yawn, yes. No, no, Tony's loving it. So you get yeah. <laughs> She doesn't have up. any filter, does she? She's just like, God, your voice is boring and I'm going to show you how bad it is. So, Thank right. Tell me what we've got coming up next week. Next, oh, next week, we are, don't make it sound like I don't know what I'm doing. I really do. Sean by now, head in hands, going, come on, get it together. Next week, we're looking at another woman. We are looking at the first Hollywood actress to, oh, I know, hold on. I always have trouble with this bit, don't I? Next week, we're looking at the first Hollywood actress to die of HIV. Oh, wow. Okay. It's not as 
straightforward as it sounds. I don't know. I'm big in my roll up now. You'll just have to listen. You're making it sound like a like an exciting, like a you know, like a twist and turny kind of true crime podcast. That's how. That's what oh. I'm expecting from you. Oh well, prepared to be disappointed. Thanks for listening to the HIV podcast. If you enjoyed our podcast, please like, rate, and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can now also follow us on Instagram and TikTok at the HIV Podcast for behind-the-scenes insights and videos.